What is going on, guys? It's Tyler Beck from T Bone MMA. UFC 260 is going live this weekend, and I thought I'd take a second here. What's going on, T Bone Experience? I, th I thought I'd take a second here to um, discuss the fights a little bit off script. I've got my brother here on the phone. Say hi, Agent. Yo, what's up, T Bone MMA? So hopefully, y'all are able to hear him. He'll be back. He's actually currently commuting to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to watch the fights with me. And I thought I'd take a second to uh, just discuss the fights. We are having a really good discussion earlier about, about these fights. And I, th I literally just stopped the conversation and said, hey, why don't we film this? Why don't we uh, enjoy it with the rest of the T-Bone MMA community? And so that's why I got, I got him on here. What's going on, Riley Porter? But yeah, we got immigrant mentality against the Ford Escort. We were literally just talking. Uh, why don't you explain the, uh, the whole podcast that Francis Ngannou had with uh, Joe Rogan earlier? It was like a sand mine, salt mine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, where he had to do a bunch of manual labor. labor. Um, and that's kind of what he, he attributes his natural power to, is doing hours and hours of repetitive movements over and over and over. Um, he eventually, uh, throughout his childhood and early um, adolescence, um, scraped, him up, scraped up enough money to go to France, where he was homeless, and trained at a boxing gym while he was homeless. Um, and that's just where he developed his skills and um, just eventually got noticed by, you know, promoters here and there, had the fight, started training MMA, um, and that's when he was recognized by the UFC. And that's obviously a very big um, overgeneralization of the whole story. I would definitely recommend going back and listening to that podcast because his upbringing and all the stories involved in that um, is very interesting. If you can squeeze that in before the fight tomorrow, it definitely gives you a really great perspective on such a great character that is given an opportunity to fight for the title. Yeah, and somebody had corrected you. It was Cameroon and not the Congo, but same thing, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Cameroon, sorry. Yeah. And when you look at it, with Stipe Miocic as well, you have just a normal blue-collar person from, obviously, the immigrant mentality comes from Croatian descendants as well. He He's such a, just a blue-collar family, still a part-time firefighter as well, and they're competing over the baddest human being on planet Earth. That's such a weird thought to me that... A former person that was homeless in France against a firefighter from Cleveland is essentially fighting to be king of the tribe of the entire human race. That's just a very fun thought in my mind. And looking at the fight um, as it is now, are you able to? Did you lose me there? All right, are you able to hear me now? I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, my phone's a little bit weird like that. Hey, bud, sorry I left you last night. Good news, except the. For a few trees, my old home was not damaged from those tornadoes. Happy to hear that, Rebecca. I was, I was thinking about that before. But looking at this fight, we were talking about the power of Francis Ngannou and comparing it to other, other heavyweights. You had mentioned Derek Lewis as well. But we kind of came to a consensus that Ngannou has this different type of power that we just hadn't seen before in the heavyweight division. We saw it a little bit with Shane Carwin. You remember when he fought Brock Lesnar? And that was, uh, he was a different breed as well. And Ninganu, he's got this different, what's going on, Al Snow? Al Snow says hi, by the way. Um, I think I cut out for a second. Go, go figure. Um, you able to hear me now? Yep. Okay, yep. good. Would you mind just plugging, can you plug in your headphones to your, to your phone? But the thing is, they won't be able to hear it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's okay. just it. Um, about Shane Carwin and fighting Brock Lesnar and that sort of power but what we were really originally talking about in our conversation before we started streaming was uh, uh, the power of Derek Lewis um, and I think the difference between Francis Ngannou and Derek Lewis is Derek Lewis is obviously if we can't his power is also unmatched I mean he's up there with Francis Ngannou but he's really shown it in, at times where he's really needed it um when he fought Alexander Volkov, you know, get those last-second knockouts, you know, him being an underdog in his last fight, 
uh, and just harnessing that power for those one shots. Where Francis Ngannou, like you said, every shot he throws has that kind of power, which makes him so dangerous. It's it's this kind of Ivan Drago type of power where it's everything he's hit in his last four fights he destroyed. His last four fights have lasted a combined total of two minutes and forty five seconds. That's unheard of. And yeah, there's a lot of other heavyweights. Are you still able to hear me? This is going terrible so far. I was picturing in my head that it was going to go better. Are you still able to hear me, AJ? Yeah, it, 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 it got cut out just a little bit there um, in between me talking and you saying two minutes and 45 seconds. Maybe just uh, um, maybe just lower your voice a little bit. I think that works a little bit better when you can just lower your voice. No, it's my phone is what it is. When it got dragged through the when I got dragged and got dragged through the uh, through the creek bed, it kind of messed some things up. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was working just fine before, too, so I don't... Yeah. Hopefully it'll get, we'll, we'll get on a roll here. We'll get on We're a roll. Right but yeah. uh, Francis has that type of X-Factor knockout power that just doesn't make any sense. He anything, he, He's taken out two former champions. Okay, my, my duct tape sign just collapsed. This is going great so far. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll push through it. Um, I'm just going to set that down. Um, what was I about to say? Um, you were talking about uh, Francis Ngani taking down uh, two former champions. Yeah, the, I mean, Junior DeSantos and Cain Velasquez had some of the most, had the, one of the most epic trilogies in heavy, heavyweight history. And he took them out in a combined minute and 30 seconds. Granted, it was later in their careers, but those were the two kings for the longest time. And Kane, at one point, was one of the best, if not the best heavyweight. And it was his return fight. It was going to go great. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he ran into Francis Ngannou, obviously. And that was a glancing blow that Francis had landed. It wasn't even this full power shot. That's the kind of power that he has. He doesn't need to connect. Obviously, the full forward escort is what we saw when he fought uh, Alist- Alistair Overeem. We saw that when he landed that flush shot. Nobody would have taken that. But yeah, the most vicious knockout, arguably, of all time right there. I mean, splitting his cheek open and all, everything was just gnarly. The, the way that he put him out... It, it was just incredible, and where Steep and Stepe has one heck of a chin as well. He's got this kind of chin that, I mean, the the shot that Daniel Cormier hit him with, it's not going to be the same type of shot that Francis hit him with as well. Because DC, he landed a shot. I, I I say it time and time again that the shots that are the most powerful are the ones you don't see, and that overhand right that DC landed on Stepe in the clinch like that. It, it, it was something that Stipe didn't see because Daniel Cormier created this um, this artif- this clinch that he used to set up the overhand right. Meanwhile, Francis is throwing from the hip and throwing bombs, and Stipe was able to get out of the way of it. Um, and Stipe ate a lot of big shots in their first fight as well, um, and he kind of walked through it. And that's where the chin of Stipe is going to have to hold up is with those glancing blows. Do you think that his chin will be compromised in this fight at all? Compared to the last fight with DC, uh, anyway. So, I th- I think he's got he's grown in the striking, especially since the last time he, him and Francis fought. Um, but I think my prediction is that he's going to try to take it to the ground and maybe take a different approach. Um, I don't know if that's kind of uh, kind of out of left field, but I I think he's going to try to avoid standing and striking of Francis Ngannou just because. He had that one punch knockout power where he was able to stand with Daniel Cormier. He wasn't, you know, Daniel Cormier is not known for his striking, but I mean, he was heavyweight champion of the world at one time too. He knows how to throw a punch or two, and he did knock out Stipe at one point. Um, but I, I think in this fight, Stipe is going to want to, you know, keep his distance and try to score points in different ways. Somebody somebody suggested a hundred mile an hour tape for the uh, for the sign. No, not even that. That's worse than regular duct tape. That's what we use to like cover up some stuff on our helmets when we jump and stuff. That that stuff is absolute garbage. But um, I just thought that was kind of funny. But 
Yeah, and Steve, I mean, uh, Daniel Cormier definitely has some deceiving level of striking. I mean, training at AKA for as long as he has, but it's a different type of striking because Francis Ngannou, he has an 83, a whopping 83 inch reach. And I ran the numbers on this in a 20, in a 25 foot octagon, because they're fighting in a smaller octagon too. His arm length is about a little, little over 25% of the entire octagon. That's freaking crazy. There's only so many places that Stipe can go. On the flip side of that token, that's the same thing for Francis Ngannou, specifically with the takedowns. Now, how big of a factor does the smaller cage play in some of these fights? It's it's kind of been difficult to tell, but one thing in particular, at least if you ask me, that will cause some problems for Stipe um, when you consider the amount of movement that he needs to get away from Francis, the amount of head movement that he utilized in the first fight, and the... Uh, distance that he had to create to go for some of the takedowns that he had um, might cause him some problems with the smaller octagon. How do you think the smaller octagon might fare in this fight? Um, so, yeah, like you said, Francis Ngannou, literally his body takes up 25% of the octagon itself. So, you know, the movement of Stipe and being able to avoid those big shots is going to be detrimental to his literal survival but if he can do that and get some uh towards some points inside when they're on the feet you know um land some cl- good clean punches from the clinch that sort of thing uh that's going to be huge for him especially in the grand scheme of things um and the, the way i'm the way i envision this fight uh, happening for stipe you know stipe to win this fight i think he needs to go either all five rounds and score all the points um, and just try to survive each round and avoid those big shots in the reach of Francis Ngannou. I think that's I, that's how I would game plan it. Um, yeah, and that's what kind of the... Un- that's what the universal consensus kind of says as well. But And Francis got one hell of a chin too. I mean, right. he, he, he's eaten some big shots as well, as particularly from Stipe. And he... I don't think he's ever been in a vulnerable situation in his entire career. Not that I think that not that comes off the top of my head anyway. So based on that logic, Stipe needs a decision victory, a extremely unlikely scenario that he gets a, I mean, he's got zero submissions in his entire career. Um, and Francis is almost, I mean, who knows? I mean, I highly doubt Stipe will go for a submission in this fight. So it's either knockout or decision for Stipe, and very likely probably a decision for Stipe based on how he's fighting, uh, or how right. he fought Danny Cormier at least. Right. Um, oh, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Oh, um, I was just going to touch on, so Stipe's game plan, what we're kind of hypothesizing is that he's going to, you know, take a more laid-back approach, take strikes when he can, and score the points and play the long game, I think that just incentivizes Francis Ngannou to take advantage of his power, take advantage of his one-punch knockout um, gift that he has. And that, I mean, that in and of itself is, you know, kind of, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves maybe a little bit on how the fight's going to actually go. But, you know, if Francis can harness all of his power and get a one punch on Stipe, I think I think that's what he's going to go for. So this fight could literally end at any time, and that's what gets me so excited. And about that's heavyweight. That's what's crazy about Francis Ngannou, too. He might come out with the same style that he fought Jarzinho Rosenstrike with, and just start throwing haymakers and hope one of them connects. And that's not a terrible game plan for him. That's what's so funny about Francis Ngannou. That's not a terrible game plan. Just throw the exactly. kitchen sink at him and see what happens. It, exactly. I mean, Francis, um, and I, I hate to bring him up again, but he's my boy. Francis Ngannou and Derek Lewis fight very much the same where they're brawlers. Derek Lewis is your textbook brawler. As in, he doesn't have any other skill than other, other than knocking people out and throwing like a wild head kick. But uh, that's what makes him so fun to watch, and that's what makes me a fan of both of them. Is they can literally be spectacular in a moment, in a time, which which is just such a treat to watch. It, it really is. I mean, neither of them are the most skilled, but that's the thing with the heavyweights. It doesn't almost doesn't matter. I mean. 
heavyweights typically, I mean, you don't see undefeated heavyweights. That's why Cain Velasquez was such a gem at the time uh, when he was coming up through the division. Um, you're you're going to lose as a heavyweight, and that's what makes Stipe so incredible. And with Francis, too, he's the only guy, the only guy to ever have this kind of one-trick pony type of knockout power to have any sort of success at the heavyweight weight class. I go back to Shane Carwin that relied heavily only on his knockout power. Now, Shane Carwin was also a high-level wrestler as well. But after he lost to Brock, he fought terrible against Junior Dos Santos and then had to retire. Now, that was also due to a lot of injuries. But what makes Francis Ngannou so interesting is after that Stipe fight, he had that, I call it a no contest against um, Derek Lewis. I mean, let's just be fair. That fight didn't happen. But I think that spoke volumes to the confidence. <laughs> yeah. I would still think that spoke volumes to the confidence of Francis Ngannou at the same time. I mean, that he looked severely compromised in that fight. He didn't have that killer instinct. He went into that Stipe fight with a ton of ego. And he it was almost like he was afraid to to feel that kind of fatigue, something that he probably hasn't felt before, and certainly not in the octagon. Um, but maybe even in training, he hadn't felt that kind of, uh, that burning in your lungs type of sensation. And you know it, I mean, you're a runner too. That sucks. Absolutely. Yeah, especially if you're not used to it. It's, to touch on that, um, the Derek Lewis and Francis Ngannou um, fight way back when, um, that was one of our, we, we actually covered that fight together and it was one of the most underwhelming cards we've ever done together. Uh, uh, well, fights, rather. Fights, fights, yeah. That card was pretty good because uh, that's when DC knocked out Stipe. That, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a great fight, uh, fight card, but um, the fight itself was very underwhelming. Um, I actually listened to a different podcast with Derek Lewis and Frank, or, uh, Derek Lewis and Joe Rogan. For whatever, Joe, for whatever reason, Joe Rogan's been having a lot of heavyweights on podcasts like, lately, but... Um, Derek Lewis actually touched on that fight and he was talking about how Francis had a little bit of um, hesitancy in the ring because he was afraid of getting knocked out because he had never been in that situation before because of his previous fight before that and um, Derek Lewis was also dealing with a lot of injuries during um, that time too and the fact that they were even able to come up with a decision for that fight is just nasty so um, that, and this is something we talked about before we started streaming is how badly we want a rematch of that or at least I do I don't know about you D- depending on how this fight goes that's a very likely possibility that Ninganu and Derek Lewis will cross paths again in the future depending on how this fight will go right right and obviously um, John Jones is in the mix as well so there's a lot of different, really different avenues of you know fights that could be concocted based off of this fight coming up or coming up tomorrow which makes it even more exciting to watch because there's so much there's so many different possibilities that can happen with this these group of elite fighters it's a really good time to be a fight fan it, oh my goodness it, it really is with everything going on at the lightweight division but everything there's so many different fights but yet none to make right now it, it's so such a weird time but man i don't think the ufc has ever been so stacked as it is right now in terms of up-and-coming contenders. There was a time where we had Cain Velasquez, John Jones, Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre, and Frankie Edgar as a champion, Jose Aldo as a champion as well, Dominic Cruz, I think. There was this, there was this time where all those guys were champions at once. That was a weird time, but the divisions weren't as stacked as they are right now when you look at the top 15 of every weight class, as a matter of fact. I mean, when was the last time we were talking about a stacked welterweight division I don't, I don't think that's <laughs> I don't know if it's ever happened it, exactly and we'll put a pin on that because the co-main event's an excellent fight between Vicente Luque and Tyron Woodley we'll put a pin on that but um, I wanted to talk about you brought up John Jones yeah, earlier we'll, we'll back around here. Um, I think you, you just cut off for a second there but yeah we'll definitely swing back around and touch on that yeah, and the um, let's go down the different outcomes. It, who, depending on who wins this fight, because um, right now it really seems like John Jones is next in line, regardless of who wins. Do you do you agree with me there? I definitely agree. Um, and with that, yeah, 
John Jones, obviously, has been packing on the pounds. I think last I heard he was at, like, 40 or 50. He's getting thick. He's getting, he's getting big, and that's what it sounded like. That's what, and that's a fight that fans want as well. We we want to see John Jones fight. We just want to see John Jones fight at this point. I want to see him fight Jan Blahovich more than I do. Uh, maybe not quite against Stipe, because I really think um, that would be the most incredible fight that the UFC could ever make. I, I really believe that. Let's go down the hypothetical situation. Or the maybe likely scenario where Stipe wins this fight and faces John Jones. I truly believe that's the biggest fight that the UFC could ever, ever put together. I, I, I don't think besides Habib versus Tony, I don't think there's a bigger fight that the UFC could ever put between two of the best fighters, the consensus best heavyweight against the consensus by best light heavyweight, and really determine who's the greatest fighter of all time, or at, at least. Um, in terms of like the heavier weight classes, best fighter in UFC history, I think that's perfectly fair. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, we we look at John Jones and the, the asterisk by his name with all this controversy surrounding his career. But when when you get down to the statistics and what he has accomplished in the ring, bar none, that man is lethal and the best to ever do it. Now, that comes with an asterisk because of everything that has happened. I personally don't think that um, all character aside, all the, the mistakes that he's made, I don't think that takes anything away of what he's actually accomplished as a mixed martial artist. Yeah. With, and that, said, um, with that said, you're absolutely correct. Him, Stipe, in the octagon, Stipe has beat Daniel Cormier, who's arguably one notch below uh, John Jones. John Jones, Stipe haven't fought. Uh, John Jones obviously moving up a weight class, which statistically gives him an advantage, actually. Um, fighters are actually at an advantage when they move up a weight class to fight for the title in the next uh, weight class. Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, that's the, that's the all-time greatest super fight to ever happen. If, if it does, if it does happen, I, I, I really believe now, maybe it won't be the biggest fight, like pay-per-view draw wise. It's certainly going to break a million if Stipe and John Jones fight. I, I think it'll break a million, but Sorry, in terms of, oh, I, I said that if, um, you said, uh, you, you won't, you don't believe it'll be the biggest fight. I don't think it'll be the biggest draw. I don't think it'll beat Habib McGregor. I think that's a record that has been set and will be unbreakable until, I don't know a different fighter that has yet to be born yet um, takes the takes the torch and runs with it, um, and then outsells McGregor. But I don't see that happening. I, I legitimately don't. I think McGregor has set the bar, and I don't, I'm not sure if it'll ever be be reached again. But that being said, in terms of stylistically wise, and I, I think that's the biggest fight. I mean, you have the greatest heavyweight of all time. This is equivalent in my mind to Anderson Silva against George St. Pierre. That that's perhaps the greatest fight that never happened, that should have happened. That if I could go back in time and make one fight happen, it's Anderson versus GSP. Let's let's be fair, especially when their stocks were at their highest. And right now we have the stars aligning with Stipe and John Jones, where we might have that. You the MMA gods have not spared us when it comes to super fights like Anderson, like and people were calling for Anderson against John Jones and Israel Adesanya against John Jones. That's all crap. That's all crap. Because um, John Jones would blow him out of the water. GSP versus Anderson is a very competitive fight. And who knows what would have happened if their, their pass had crossed. Um, but in terms of super fights, John Jones versus Stipe could make up for that. Are, do you agree with me there? Absolutely. Um, and... I guess when I was talking about biggest fight of all time, I guess I was looking at it the lens of an actual MMA fighter. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as eyes on the fight, I don't think that it would draw as, as much as Habib and McGregor. Obviously, Habib um, being a celebrity overseas and McGregor being the, celebrity, the guy that he is now, um, drawing all the eyes. But um, I'm looking at it the lens of biggest fight of all time, you know, people will look back on that and be like, oh my gosh, these were two giants that fought each other. They know? were two giants at the prime of their careers 
uh, with their the prime of their, their careers and their legend status already cemented. It wasn't like we saw there was one super fight that happened way too early, and that was Dominic Cruz against Henry, or, uh, not Henry Cejudo, but Demetrius Johnson. That fight happened, but it happened too early, so that doesn't count. That was a super fight that I'd equival, uh, that I'd equate to a fight like Anderson Silva versus George St. Pierre, but it happened way earlier in their career, and it, it didn't really count, if you ask me. Yeah, it was for a title, but it still didn't count, if you ask me. It wasn't this big super fight. Um, but the, the stars have aligned for Stipe versus John. I think that'd be the biggest fight, biggest super fight ever. I, I really believe that. Absolutely, which makes which makes it so exciting. And we're we're at the very beginning of you know getting to the top of that pyramid through this big super fight that this fight is leading up to. I hate to look at it like this fight doesn't matter. You know, I I think this is a unique situation. Because it's almost like, yeah, there's a belt being fought for tomorrow, and that's, you know, the best man in the world. But we're looking at this as, like, like a tournament style because we have so many different contenders in the heavyweight division that it's, are going to step in and fight the winner of this fight. And when have we ever said that? I mean, there is a time, I mean, we, we have new heavyweights that are competing for titles. For the longest time, the heavyweight division was dominated by guys like Fabricio Verdum, Alistair Overeem, Cain Velasquez, Junior Dos Santos. I'm cut now. Oh, sorry. Um, you but said we have new heavyweights in that cut. We got new blood in the heavyweight division. For the longest time, it was ruled by guys like Mark Hunt, by Cain Velasquez, by uh, Junior Dos Santos, Fabricio Verdum, all these old guys that their primes were kind of in their past. But now we're starting to see these new heavyweights come up and start to fill that role. It's a really cool thing to see. And Stipe was one of those guys too. He was a guy that, that was a young, I mean, not not young, but new to the game still in terms of mixed martial arts because he's an older fighter. He got into MMA at a latter age. Same thing with uh, Francis Ngani too. I mean, Francis isn't as, how old is Francis again? He's not as old as Stipe. Um, no, I think he's in his early 30s. Let me double check that. I mean, he's 34, which is still an elevated age comparatively to a lot of other fighters anyway, um, but still relatively young in terms of uh, heavyweights. Um, but Stipe got into the game at an older age. Uh, not I quite... I'm, a, now, I, uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a weird area. I, I'm out in the middle of nowhere, so... So you might be cutting it out. Um, yeah. All right, but I'll, I'll keep going, though, and... Well, well, you threw me off my game, but yeah, this is the Stipe was one of those guys, one of those new bloods that came up and took the division by storm, knocking out Andre Arlovsky, one of those guys that was up there for a very long time. Another prominent example of older heavyweights that still had a lot of prominence. I mean, um, he had knocked out Andre Arlovsky. That's how he got the shot at the title against Fabricio Verdum. And now we're starting to see guys like Surreal gone and. Um, even Derek Lewis can be thrown in the mix too. He's fought for a long time. Francis Ngani. We're starting to see this new blood and this new resurgence of new heavyweight talent. That's really fun to see. I want to pull up the rankings uh, in the heavyweight division now that I'm on the topic of it. Because it's really fascinating to see how many new names we have at that weight class. Um, taking a second for it to load. Yeah, I think it's also interesting. I was looking at the UFC's Instagram account, and they posted like this 10-minute highlight reel of the evolution of the heavyweight belt. And it's very interesting to go back and look at the, you know, just little snippets and highlights of the of past um, heavyweight title fights, and just look at the evolution of the heavyweight MMA fighter in the UFC. Yeah, and How, it, you know, he's just big brawlers, not technical. You know, no real game plan other than just throwing, throwing hands, throwing guys around, ground and pound. You know, um, I mean, you had the a lot more technical. It, it really has, and we saw a glimmer of that when Murray Smith fought Mark Coleman. But for the longest time, it was wrestlers dominating. I mean, Kevin Randman won the title. We had Mark, Mark Coleman won the title, first heavyweight champion. Randy Couture was a wrestler. And these, for the longest time, it was the wrestler. And I'm trying to think of, the, of um, when it started to change. In fact, I have the list of the heavyweight oh, I get the heavyweight champions, but I, I, I had dropped uh, outside uh, in my common area. 
But, and then we started to see there's this weird time where it wasn't the UFC that had the most prominent weight class. It was Pride with Fedor Emelianenko and Manitaro Noguera and Igor Volchanchin. Even Mark Coleman fought over there when he kind of had his career resurgence. And the UFC was just kind of in this weird spot. You know, you had Fedor against Meditaro Noguera. If you ask me, that's one of the greatest heavyweight trilogies ever. And, and you look at the skills of those guys. Meanwhile, Tim Sylvia is in a five-round just dud against Jeff Munson. Um, now it's it's unified that the UFC has the best heavyweight division, clearly. And when you actually trace the linear belt from Mark, the belt that Mark Coleman won, and then lost to Marie Smith, and then Marie Smith lost it to Randy Couture. Randy Couture left the UFC, and then they had to start a new belt off. That's when Boss Rutten fought Kevin Randleman. But you can trace the lineage of the original belt back to Stipe. This is the only division where you can say that. Like, if you look at who Randy Couture lost to, which I believe was Ensign Anyway, and I think Ensign Anyway lost to some other fighter who lost to Fedor, who lost to Verdum, who lost to... Um, uh, I, I can't even remember. It's, it gets a little foggy after that. I think it was, it might have been Overeem, but I don't remember off the top of my head. But eventually it came back to, um, as a matter of fact, yeah, it was Overeem. Overeem lost to, Overeem lost to Bigfoot Silva, of all people, and then Bigfoot Silva lost to Kane Velasquez, if I'm remembering correctly. And then Kane eventually lost to Verdum, and then Verdum lost to Stipe. So the, the true legitimate heavyweight belt that Dan Severn won, or not Dan, Mark Coleman won against Dan Severn can be traced to Stipe Miocic, and that's the only division where you can say that. Every other weight class, you know what's funny? If you play that game, who who won the initial um, welterweight title was Pat Militich. Pat Militich lost it to Carlos Newton. Carlos Newton lost it to Matt Hughes, and then Matt Hughes lost it to BJ Penn. If you trace the lineage of that belt in particular, I think it's the Walt Twain. No, 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 no. I'm thinking light heavyweight when Frank Shamrock left the UFC and then um, fought in another organization, lost to Henzo Gracie. Henzo lost to Nick Diaz, of all people. Nick Diaz lost to George St. Pierre. George St. Pierre is the linear champion in three different weight classes if you play that game, which is a crazy thought, by the way. And technically, Leota Machida um, beat BJ Penn after BJ Penn won the Walt Twain Championship. Um, so Leona Machida eventually, eventually, if you follow that belt, John Jones is currently the sitting linear 170 pound champion. Are you picking up what I'm putting down there? Um, yeah, you might have lost me a little bit because that was a lot of knowledge at once, but I'm sure a lot of the fans are still tracking. Yeah, I, I totally went down a weird rabbit hole there, but... If you trace the legitimate title from the original winner, like when the division started, Stipe is the the heavyweight championship right now is the only division where you can say that they are both the uh, unified champion of the UFC and the linear champion of the start of the belt. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes one hundred percent sense. Yeah, um, so that's a that's a weird thought because. Um, when you look at the consensus best, you had Pride back in those days, but then eventually Pride was unified with the UFC. Now, even though Fedor didn't come to the UFC, he lost to Farisi over Doom, who lost to um, Alistair Overeem, who lost to uh, Bigfoot Silva, who lost to Kane, who lost to for, for Doom, and now we're back to Stipe again. Um, he has truly legit. He has legitimately unified the Pride belt, the UFC belt, and the uh, original UFC belt, by the way, which was won by Mark Coleman, who is from Ohio, if I'm not mistaken, or at least he went to school in Ohio. I'm pretty sure Mark Coleman's from Ohio. So think about it that way, full circle. Isn't that weird? Baddest man on the planet, both two of them from Ohio. That's just a weird thought. Yeah, that is that is a weird thought. Um, But let's go down the route. We were talking about if Stipe wins and uh, fights John Jones. How about Ninganu fighting John Jones? That would be an interesting fight, freaking, freaking fight too. Talk about you think that they could uh, hold hands, stretch their arms out, and with the other hand touch the other side of the octagon. <laughs> We're comparing uh, comparing reach. Eighty-three inch reach uh, with Anderson Silva at. Uh, excuse me, John, John Jones. Jones John Jones has like I think he's got an 80, 85 inch reach. He's got a freaking yeah. long reach. Yeah, we got some long dudes in there. 
And if they fought in a smaller octagon, which if they fought, which they wouldn't, um, this is this will be if you ask me anyway. Yeah, he's got an eighty-four and a half inch reach, John Jones, which is only an inch and a half longer than Ngannou. Um, but th this is going to be the end of an era, if you ask me, with the UFC, at least at the apex for pay-per-views, uh, because now they're starting to go to in-person stadiums. Now, unless we have another COVID outbreak, this is going to be the last of it. So I guess this will be a tribute to all the fights, all the pay-per-views that happen at the apex. But yeah, nonetheless, some long dudes. And the power of Ninganu might be the only kryptonite in John Jones's armor when you're not named Dominic Reyes. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, um, those are two long and dangerous dudes fighting in the octagon, but obviously no one's better at using their length than John Jones. Oh, it, it's undeniable. That's what ma like, that's yeah. definitely he, – he's all around a great athlete, but I, if you ask me, that's what separates him from everybody else is his ability to utilize reach and utilize the cage and get his opponents in a position where if they're backing up, they're backing up into the cage. But if they move forward, they're moving into his eye pokes. Um, Absolutely. Right, right. But his, not, not only is he able to use his reach to his advantage like no one else, the creativity that comes with that and the fight IQ that just kind of comes natural to him makes him even more... It makes him who he is. His creativity and fight mind and the way he's able to throw strikes out of nowhere is what makes him so dangerous and why he is, you know, the GOAT. Uh, right yeah. Now. I mean, it's it's undeniable if you ask me. He's the, the at least style, if you, if you at least look at it skills-wise, he's the greatest ever, John Jones. And... But that doesn't matter. He's got one hell of a chin. But if you eat the full Ford Escort to the face, you're not going to survive that. And that might be the only way to beat him unless you're Dominic Reyes. Were you able to get all that? Yeah, it looks like he cut out a little bit. Um, just let I'm me know. Good, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay, okay. That might be it. And there might be this weird satisfaction. It might be this Floyd Mayweather effect where you might just tune in to Ninganu versus Jones. Now, somebody had mentioned that earlier that John Jones against Francis Ninganu would be the bigger pay per view draw than Steve Bay versus Jones. And I completely agree for that Floyd Mayweather type of effect because Francis, he certainly might be the only guy that can beat John Jones. That, that's just because he's got the knockout power to knock anybody out he can beat anybody on any given day and he might be the only guy that could perhaps beat john jones so we might just tune in to see john jones lose that floyd mayweather effect you know and i think at least myself i'm so fed up with john jones you know i'm not a fan of his um but he's the greatest to ever do it he certainly might be anyway He's got one loss on his right. record, which was a DQ loss after Steve Mazzagatti asked a deaf um, Matt Hamill if he could continue while there's blood dripping in his eyes, and he didn't respond. That's the only reason why he's not undefeated. Other than that, and then that Dominic Reyes fight, which he freaking lost. Um, he lost that fight. Regardless of how I feel about that fight, I think the consensus from anybody that watched that fight was that John Jones lost. But Francis, I mean, to beat him, beat him, might be the only guy. He might be the only one. Yeah, especially the way it is right now. But, you know, uh, we have to look back on that Dominic Reyes fight. Is, is John Jones on a downward, you know, downward trend? That was his last fight. He won the last fight on, and you know, on the numbers. That's, that's who won the fight. That's who won the fight, yep. We can bitch and moan about it all we want. That's who won the fight. Fair um, enough. But, but, you know, that makes him vulnerable. And, and you, you know, it, we, we can chat all day about, you know, did he move up to heavyweight because he had no one left to fight at light heavyweight? Is that really why? Or is he running because he doesn't want to fight Dominic Reyes slash uh, Blahovich? You know, there, I mean, there's a lot of reasoning. Um, but... You know, for him to make the move to heavyweight now, it just made, it did make sense because he's going to, you know, make a name for himself in the heavyweight division, solidify, solidify his 
you know, named in the GOAT Hall of Fame, you know? I mean, it made sense for him. We can speculate all we want about different motivations um, and about, you know, the Donovan Hermes fight and whether or not he won, you know, yada, yada. Uh, but I think what, what we have to take from his last fight is that he is vulnerable. He is beatable, you know? Um, you know, he just had that one loss on his record because of uh, the technicality, but, you know, in, in everyone's eyes that knows anything about him, has been following it for a while. He is undefeated. So, yeah. you saw him show vulnerability, and I think that's just going to bring more attention to the fight. Like you said, it, we're going to watch We're going to watch him. We're, I mean, no, he could lose. That would, that's what oh. makes it more interesting. That's what makes all of these fights in these stacked divisions interesting you know because anyone can win yeah there's, there's not yeah. there's no heavy favorites in these stacked divisions because there's there's so much variability right now and it's and like you said it's going to lead to as the apex is coming to an end now that covid's over and um it's going to drive these pay-per-views up and it's it, that's that's exciting yeah and i might have to I might have to disagree with you uh, in terms of his timing when moving up to heavyweight. Um, I think that was there. Were, we wanted to see John Jones at heavyweight for years. We wanted to see him fight guys like Cain Velasquez or Junior Dos Santos or even for BC Verdun was champion for just a short amount of time. But in terms of the timing, that was the one time that we wanted to see John Jones have a rematch, immediate rematch with someone. Oh, it did. Um, that was the one time. Okay, that was the one time that we saw John Jones. We wanted to see a rematch. That was the one time where there was some sort of intrigue in the light heavyweight division. And then he started some beef with Jan Blachowicz too, and that would have been a good fight too right after Jan Blachowicz knocked out uh, Corey Anderson. And he went up to heavyweight at a weird time where Steve Bay was fighting Daniel Cormier. There was this whole thing going back and forth between them, obvious trilogy fight that was going to happen between them. And now he's holding up the heavyweight division. I think it was a weird time for him to leave. And now that the light heavyweight division is, for the first time, interesting, he's left it. I, I think it was horrible timing. Now, that being said, though, I'm excited to see him at heavyweight. We wanted to see it. But there's always a give and take when you're MMA fans. And that's the give and take there. Right now, we have, we're have in this weird situation um, where we want... It makes, I shouldn't say it makes sense, but there are fights for him at 205 as well that he's kind of missing out on. So I, I really believe that any time John Jones tries to promote himself, he shoots himself in the foot. I mean, he, we're dealing with a guy that's not very smart. He doesn't know how to promote himself, but he's the greatest fighter ever. Anytime that he puts, a, puts an Instagram post out there, anytime that he tries to promote himself, he shoots himself in the foot and looks like an idiot. Um, that's the kind of guy that he is. Like you remember during the whole protest when he took spray paint from those dudes in an obviously staged situation, he's that kind of dumb person that thinks everybody around him is dumb too. Um, that's, that's just it. And I, I might have to disagree with you that that was the best timing. There were fights for him at 205 that people were interested in. And now we're in a situation where people are questioning him as champion and he's done nothing about it. People were questioning about that Dominic Reyes fight. And after that fight, Dominic Reyes went and got starched by Jan Blachowicz, by the way. And then Israel Adesanya came up to 205. Everybody, except for myself, I didn't want to see this fight. I wasn't that interested in it. But everybody wanted to see Israel Adesanya against Jon Jones. But who gets that fight? Jan Blachowicz. Jan Blachowicz is kind of filling that void that Jon Jones left. And is is fighting fights that Jon Jones should have fought. Um... So I think it's it's extremely strange situation if you ask me. Um, but that being said, though, what's that? That being said, though, yeah. That being said, though, if he fights at heavyweight, it's I'm gonna watch it for sure because now he's a heavyweight. I, he's not coming back down to 205. But um, yeah, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I guess what, what um, there is some truth to um, you know him. Having fights at 205, but at the time, you know, after the Dominic Reyes fight, other than running it back to Dominic Reyes, which would have been just, definitely justified for John Jones. If you're John Jones, do you go and fight a guy that you barely beat 
after you've been winning all these fights, or do you go up to heavyweight where you know you have opportunities to progress your career? Like if you're John Jones, what do you what do you do? Because this is before we knew about Blahovitz. You know, I mean, he was a stud, but when he knocked out Dominic Reyes the way he did, that's when he made his name, and that's when he became, you know, uh, a name for John Jones to fight. But who was saying Jan Blahovitz needs to fight John Jones after he beat Dominic Reyes? Um, I, I was saying the Corey Anderson fight when he knocked out Corey Anderson, and they had that back and forth where they were kind of like flexing at each other. There was a little bit of spark there, and people were going to be interested in it. Now, his, Jan Blachowicz's stock is absolutely through the roof, um, comparatively to then, anyway. So I'll give you that much, at least. Yeah, because if you're, if you're, yeah, if, if you're John Jones, you want the big money fight. The big money fights are in the heavyweight division. You're going to get so much street cred in the MMA community for, for you know, going up and fighting heavyweight, fighting for the title. You know you're going to get a title shot right at the beginning. You know, oh yeah, he, he's not gonna. Have, he knows he's gonna get the shot. So, I mean, that's why I think it's a perfect situation. I mean, for John Jones, yes, those fights at two hundred five. But as an MMA fan, like you said, Jan Blachowicz has filled that role in the two hundred five division. We can give up John Jones to go fight in, in heavyweight. You know, I mean, yeah. two hundred five is still interesting without John Jones in it. It's, I it's, think a lot of people are sick of watching him beat up on everybody. Fair enough. You bring up a lot of good points, too. Um, yeah, that's completely fair. And you're talking about the legendary status of John Jones. If John Jones gets past the winner of Steve Bavers and Ngannou, any, any arguments out the window, he's the greatest to ever do it. I think the only person besides John Jones that you can consider the greatest of all time is Amanda Nunes, George St. Pierre, and uh, Demetrius Johnson. Those are the only guys that are guys and one female that you could ever make an argument for. And if John Jones beats them, I mean, I check me. I think you're missing a name. Who? Habib. Habib, I mean, yes. The thing is, the Habib thing is... Because that he, he has barely ever lost a round. Um, that fight against Clayson Tebow, he freaking lost. Um, but that was so long ago, and he got tossed a, a good decision from the judges. But I'm not gonna hold that over his head because that was years ago. That was even pre injuries. But um, and I think that all three judges scored at 30-27 in his favor. As a matter of fact, looking back at it, I know Connor scraped by a round. But um, in terms of legacy-wise, I mean, let's just look at it this way. You can make a very easy argument for Habib being the greatest of all time. Um, very easy. And that's the 29-0 thing. That's, that's the 29-0, but um, let's look at it this way. He has three defenses of his titles, and that's it. John Jones had, I believe, eight in his initial run and then three in his second run. Not to include his interim title fight, and every time he had to re-win the title. That when you combine it all together, I believe that's 15 title fight wins compared to uh, Habib's four in total title fight wins. That's where I, I think, um, and De Habib definitely sell, sold himself short um, with his retirement. Was it the correct timing or not? Who knows? But uh, and maybe it was. Um, but imagine. You can go back to this. Imagine if Tyron Woodley stepped away, or not Tyron Woodley, that's a terrible example, but imagine if a guy like Anderson Silva retired at his height after the last def the last time he won was against Stefan Bonner. Imagine if he retired after that fight and retired. There would have been no denying that he would have been the greatest of all time because he ended on top. We saw this complete collapse that Anderson Silva had. Um, I highly doubt that Habib would have went down that path as well, but when you really look at it, that's three title defenses. Demetrius Johnson had 10 consecutive, if I'm remembering correctly. It might have even been 11, but I'm trying, I think it was 10. Um, and Habib only had one title too. That double champ status is important when it comes to double champ, or when it comes to GOAT status as well. And Habib yeah, didn't yeah. have that. So the only argument you can have at that point is the 29 and 0, which is a very fair argument as well. That's true. Um, and just to, uh, you know, piggyback off of what you said about, you know, was it the right time or not? Um, 
and I'm going to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent, but it'll be really quick. Yeah, no, um, go ahead, I go ahead. Little, I, go, I follow a little bit, and this isn't MMA related, but I follow a little bit of uh, the CrossFit, CrossFit athletes. Um, and what, my favorite one, obviously, everyone's favorite is Matt Frazier. And a little bit of background on him. He's won the last five um, fitness man competitions, and he just recently retired. And um, I was listening to an interview with him, and he was just kind of talking about why he decided to retire. And he said he hit the milestone of winning five consecutive fitness man competitions in a row in the world. Um, that was something that he had uh, gained, and he just didn't see anything else for him in that in the you know in the arena anymore. He'd become the greatest. He trains his ass off. He puts himself at risk every year to go complete this competition. And I think that kind of parallels with these fighters, you know. Um, he, he arguably retired at the peak of his career. You know, he, he had his best performance of his life, um, coming off his fifth and t- world record for most title wins in the fittest man competition. And, you know, um, do we want to watch fighters go through, like, DJ Penn? You know, he's at the long plateau. Alistair Overeem at the top, but now we watch this big, long, you know, downward curve of their career, and, you know, they're killing themselves to get back up to the top, you know, Alistair Overeem just got knocked out again, you know, and he hasn't, he hasn't been a champion in, you know, X amount of years. Maybe Habib didn't want to, you know, he's got a lot of other family-related reasons, but maybe he didn't want to go through that downward slope, and he wanted to go out on top, you know? We can only push these guys to go so far to establish themselves as, you know, the quote-unquote GOAT, you know? But maybe they don't want to go through being at their plateau. Maybe they just want to go on to the next thing, is my point, you know? Yeah, and that's fair too. But when you have to you have to look at it, if, if you're looking at GOAT talks, you have to look at it on what they've done. And I, I really think John Jones, you know, we kind of gave him that number one pound-for-pound thing as kind of a respect thing it was very temporary it was respect like thank you for everything that you did you went out on top here's number one pound for pound please come back sort of deal but when you really have to sit down and look at it i think it's john now for some reason john jones really thinks that that's a big deal in my mind even though we spent the last like 40 minutes talking about pound for pound greatest it's not that big a deal to me especially certainly not pound for pound greatest of all time talk is always fun but pound for pound talk it's it's so difficult to talk about for some reason john gets so head case about it um yeah pound for pound um it's so hard to compare it to apples to oranges the, the way the train that you know a flyweight goes through versus the heavyweight light heavyweight is completely different the fight preparation the, you know everything that goes into fighting someone at a different weight class is totally different it's almost like not a different sport but it just changes the dynamic so much you know yeah and when you talk greatest of all time i mean let's go back to stipe for a moment here look at what he's done he's got he had three consecutive title defenses lost regained the title defended it in the trilogy fight so four total consecutive defenses seven total title fight wins at heavyweight which I believe is a record. If, if it's not a record, Randy Couture, he's tied with Randy Couture. And Randy Couture, just to go through it, he defeated Kevin Randleman to win the title. I think it was against Maurice Smith first. He defeated Maurice Smith, came back, re-won the title against Mark, um, pardon me, against uh, Kevin Randleman, and then came back years later and then defeated um, that Tim Sylvia, defended the title twice after that, Gabriel Gonzaga. and um, True, true. I remember seeing that the other night. Yeah. yeah, and that's a legend of the sport, Randy Couture, and Stipe has done what he even couldn't do, and that's defend the, well, no, he defended the title once, um, his only defense in his third title run of the heavyweight championship was against uh, Tim Sylvia, because he defended it twice against Pedro Hizzo, I think it was against Pedro Hizzo, um, which by the way, the, their, their first fight was the greatest heavyweight fight in the history of the UFC, if you ask me. I'm pretty sure that was Pedro Hizzo. Let me double check. Um, Randy Couture, real quick. That was an incredible fight. Anybody that has UFC Fight Pass, go watch the first fight between... um, Yeah, it was against Pedro Hizzo. uh, UFC 31. 
that was an incredible fight. I, I'd even say it's better than Stipe versus DC, which is great number two as well. But that was an incredible fight where Randy Couture, I scored at 10-8 because he had gotten up on top of Pedro Hizo in the first round, dominated him 10-8 for Randy Couture. And then Pedro Hizo came back in the second round and hurt Randy 10-8 for Pedro Hizo. That's how incredible that fight was. That's just how I had it scored. That's not how the judges scored it. Um, and then he defeated him in the rematch, lost to Josh Barnett. Josh Barnett test positive for steroids. And then he loses to Rico Rodriguez. And then eventually won the light heavyweight championship and eventually came back at like a 43 years old, came back and defeated Tim Sylvia. So he might be one of the best heavyweights, at least on paper um, in terms of title defenses and stuff. But Stipe has blown him out of the water with all the title defenses that he has. I mean, there has to be so much respect put on Stipe's name at this point that he's just not getting. And that's incredible. The only other heavyweight that you can perhaps say is better than Stipe was Fedor. And I really think that if you put Prime Fedor against Prime Stipe in the octagon, not in the pride ring, which I really think heavily favors Fedor Milianenko at that point, but in the in the cage, Stipe beats him nine times out of ten. I truly believe he beats Prime Fedor. That's a hill that I'm not willing to fight on, however. But I truly believe that. What do you think? Um... Yeah, I mean, just this this Stipe that we're seeing right now, this prime Stipe, he just gets better with every fight. I he, mean, honestly, his yeah. loss against Daniel Cormier, um, arguably that could have been because of the eye poke. You know, I, to me, he was winning the fight really close. Um, you talking but, the first fight? I mean, oh, yeah. Did I say the second? I meant the first. Yeah, you, you were saying the first, but that fight was so quick, it was kind of hard to determine who was winning up until that point. I guess it was Steve Bay, but right, right. Yeah. still, keep going. Um, and anyways, yeah, I just I'm a big fan of Steve Bay. I'm really excited with what's gonna what's gonna go on uh, tomorrow night. You know, um, yeah. And do you, do you wanna do you wanna circle back and go uh, to the Kome? Yes, as a matter of fact. Um, we had a great discussion on that heavyweight title fight. Um, but Tyron Woodley against Vicente Luque. Let's talk Tyron Woodley in this fight because Vicente Luque is an absolute savage. Do you, do you know who he is? Have you looked, researched him at all? I, Watch him fight? I, I, I need to do a little bit more research on him. But obviously, I, I have a history with Tyron Woodley and covering him. And I've watched a lot of his fights. So. Yeah, to kind of give you a, a description of Vicente Luque, who's an absolute savage. He's 12-3 and in the UFC, 8-1 and in his last nine fights, where he defeated Nico Price, Chad LaPriest, Jalen Turner, Brian Barberina, Derek Krantz, Mike Perry. He broke Mike Perry's nose, if you remember that fight. Lost to Wonderboy, but then since then defeated I Nico... I don't believe I do. What's, it? What's that? I don't, I don't believe I do. Oh, okay. Um, and oh, then... Yeah. Defeated Nico Price and Randy Brown in his last fight. He's finished 11 out of his 12 fights in the UFC. 11. And 11 out of his 12 in the UFC, which is freaking nuts. You don't see you don't see people that are 12 and 3 in the UFC have a 90 plus percent finish rate. I mean, that's what Francis Ngannou has. Well, it's 100 percent in his wins. But he's got knockout power in his hands. He's a brown belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He lands a whopping 5.72 significant strikes per minute. To give you, to give you some perspective on that, Tyron Woodley lands two point three three, so he outstrikes him two to one, uh, at least on paper going into this fight. Okay, to to repeat that, Vicente yeah, Luque. It tends to get better when I uh, whenever I start talking. It just, it, I don't know if it's something weird with your mic or what. It, it is something weird with my mic, but stats on paper says that Vicente Luque outstrikes Tyron Woodley two to one. He's got 5.2 significant strikes landed per minute, which is off the charts compared to most fighters with 15 fights in the UFC. Um, dangerous, dangerous right. guy. And, with, uh, and his 11 I'm finishes. Sorry, am I talking over you? Uh, yeah, just give me one second here. I'm going to read this one stat off that you might like. Uh, he's got yep. his 11 finishes in the UFC. Puts him at number two all time at 170 pounds. Tied with Matt Hughes. The 11 finishes that he has. Were you able to get all that? Wow. Yeah. yeah so, dude, this dude is a... 11 of his 12 wins. Yeah, finished 11 out of his 12 wins. That Those 11 finishes 
uh, puts him at number two all time most finishes at 170. He's a savage. He is so Amazing. freaking good. And that lone loss yeah, that he has prodigy. had, prodigy. And the last his lone loss in his last nine fights was against Stephen Waterboy Thompson, one of if not the best kickboxers at 170, if not in the entire UFC. And that said, that spoke volumes to the durability of Vicente Luque. He is a durable dude. He ate some big shots against Stephen Waterboy Thompson, and not only did he eat them, he walked through them. This dude is so good and so exciting to watch, and that forward pressure might cause Tyrell Woodley some problems. Um, and he also right. and uh, former champion in Tyron Woodley, he's on a three fight losing streak. Three fight losing streak against Kamaru Usman, I mean, Gilbert well, Burns, and Colby Covington. Kamaru Usman, Gilbert Burns, and Colby Covington. Yeah. Um, so three, I mean, giants at one seventy are his last three losses, but he's coming in at uh, plus two hundred underdog here. Former champion against this new up-and-comer, which yeah. is kind of weird to see. Um, however, I don't think his style, just listening to um, you talk about um, Almeida, is that how you say his last name? Thomas Almeida? Or no, that's, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong, I'm looking at the Sugar Sean O'Malley fight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, Vicente Luque. Luque, Luque. Okay. doesn't exactly complement that because Tyron Woodley is more of a defensive fighter. You know, he's a counter guy. Very, very he's defensive, old, yeah. You know, he's, he's not finishing anybody. He's, you know, he's notorious for being a very boring fighter in my eyes because I hated watching him be the champion for so many years. <laughs> watching him fight um, uh, Stephen Wonder- Wonderboy for those two fights that they had. The first fight um, was really good, but their second fight was hot the garbage. The first fight was really good. The second fight was just, uh oh. And I, I think everyone was just kind of getting sick of Tyron Woodley at the division. So, um, so it's definitely, that's definitely going to shake some things up. I think it's a must win for Tyron Woodley. Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely it is. If, if he loses this fight with the hefty paycheck that they're paying Tyron Woodley, there's no way he's staying on the roster, especially with the cuts that they're doing, most recently with Alistair Overeem and Junior Dos Santos. There's no way that they're keeping Tyron Woodley. He's going to have a great fight with um, Douglas Lima over in Bellator if he loses this fight, if you ask me, which is a very good fight, and I'm already starting a promotion for that fight. Um, but once that... <laughs> it sounds like you don't have a whole lot of confidence in him. No, and... <laughs> I, I'll tell you the reason why that I don't have a whole lot of confidence. But Zetsi Luque uh, is, at least has I, – I, I want to confirm this, but he, he used to train with the Black Zillions and now I believe is training at Sanford MMA who might have cracked the code of Tyron Woodley because Kamar Usman, Sanford MMA, blew him out of the water. Gilbert Burns, Sanford MMA, blew him out of the water. Kobe Covington isn't a part of Sanford MMA, but still um, – but the only thing that Vicente Luque doesn't have that Usman, Burns, and Covington had is that high-level Gilbert Burns case, not takedown ability per se, but they're high-level on the ground. Because Tyron Woodley going into that fight against Kamaru Usman had only been taken down once for a brief second. And then once fighters got him down to the mat, he wasn't able to utilize his... He wasn't able to keep the fight standing and wasn't able to utilize his knockout power when you're on when his his back's on the mat. Now he does have a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but it's not the same. It, it's it's not a Damian Maya type of black belt. Um uh so I, I I think when that threat is there for the takedown, Tyron Woodley, um, when Tyron Woodley isn't able to control where the fight goes, that plays a significant factor. But another thing that might one stat that's I want to throw out there as well. Tyron Woodley absorb or he lands 2.33 significant strikes per minute. That's not a lot. That's averaging 13 strikes a round or a shade under. Thir- it's like 13 strikes a round, which is not a lot. But he only absorbs 2.72. That's not because he's this high level. He's got great head movement. He's consistently on the back foot, surrendering a lot of space. It's the fear that the opponents have of his knockout ability. He is. Wait, 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 back step, back step, back step, explode, that type of threat. 
Um, that's what always made him so dangerous. That's why he was able to outbox guys. Now, even though that second Stephen Wonderboy Thompson fight was such a downer, but at the end of the day, he still outboxed one of the best kickboxers in MMA. You got to give a lot of credit to that as well, even though it wasn't the most exciting style, but it was his own style. And it's kind of like, did you ever watch Barry Bonds play? Play baseball? Yeah. Do you remember, it was like 2004, where he had the highest OPS, the on-base plus slugging percentage, but specifically his on-base percentage, was Babe Ruth level. And that was one of the fewest home runs that he had ever hit in his entire career. But it was because he got walked so much. It was the fear that he had. And that's the same thing that Tyron Woodley had. It was the fear of that knockout power. That's how he was able to to beat guys like Darren Till. Well, he cracked Darren Till, and he actually outstruck Darren Till 74-1 to in that fight, 57-0 to in the significant strike department. But that's how he was able to beat a guy like Stephen Warner Thompson in a kickboxing fight. Would he be able to implement this same style against Vicente Luque? I don't think so. I think that forward pressure from Vicente Luque will cause Tyron Woodley some problems in this fight. And I'm excited to see how Tyron Woodley is able to deal with those problems. I, I really am. This is such an intriguing matchup, and it's such a fun one for so many levels. And it's an excellent opportunity for Vicente Luque as well to finally break in and have his breakthrough performance, which he was supposed to have against Wonderboy. If he had beaten Wonderboy, that would have propelled his career forward tremendously. Um, but the same thing could be said with Tyron Woodley, if not more so than a, uh, a victory over Wonderboy. That's what makes this such an interesting fight and such an interesting dynamic. Um, and you got to wonder if one, if Tyron Woodley, I mean, he's got the rest, wrestling accolades as well. Uh, he hasn't ever really relied on that too much. Um, but yeah, this is a very fun fight. Very fun fight. Very important fight as well. I love everything about this fight. Uh, there's something that intrigues me at least, a fighter that's trying to hold his spot within the promotion, and that's what Tyron Woodley has. Did I did I sell this fight to you at all? <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I'm always looking for you know that big explosive up and comer too. So I'm excited to to learn a little bit more about uh, uh, the Luke. Luke. Yeah. Luke. <laughs> um, that's a very very fun fight. Um, by the way, I'm reading your comments. I'm reading your guys' comments through this, and I, I appreciate it. Tyron Woodley, like, get on his heels again, you know? It's always interesting to watch a guy fight for his career, you know? Um, he's not fighting to defend his title anymore. He's, he's fighting to just stay in the ring. Stay just to, just to, yeah. Because there's nothing more motivating than, you know, fight or flight, you know? There's nothing more motivated motivating that so um, that's and, gonna be really exciting and maybe that's what he needs this will be a stand-up fight it won't be like Colby Covington where he took him down and kind of beat the living crap out of him and it wasn't like Gilbert Burns where he got cracked initially oh sorry um I'm good I'm Okay, it won't be like when he fought Gilbert Burns where he got cracked right out of the gate or when he fought Colby Covington it was just kind of ragdolled a lot of the time cutting out again yeah okay it won't be like what but um, it won't be like him fighting Gilbert Burns where he got cracked in the first minute or when he fought Colby Covington. He had a broken rib early on in the fight and was just kind of smothered the entire fight. This will be a guy that will push the pace and will largely be a stand-up fight that prime Tyron Woodley that during his title run would have probably had zero problems with. And you're exactly right. Maybe because of how hesitant Tyron Woodley is, we always wanted to see him finally uncork something like he did against Robbie Lawler and Darren Till. Maybe we'll see that Tyron Woodley. Maybe we'll see a different Tyron Woodley that we haven't seen before. Kind of like a motivated McGregor type of thing. Maybe we'll see a motivated Woodley. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely going to be easy. Yeah, um, it's definitely... Um, you can definitely compare what he has to do to Conor McGregor's situation. You know, Conor McGregor was on top, but he's had a few difficult losses very good fighters uh, recent. So, um, yeah, you, you love to see a guy work his ass off to just stay doing what he loves. So, um, 
I'm not a huge Tyron Woodley fan just because I think he's kind of a boring fighter, but I am excited to see what he's going to bring to the table tomorrow. I'm not lo- saying I don't think he's a good guy. I'm just saying I don't like his fighting style as much as I like other oh, fighters. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, even his personality was kind of hard to get behind. Um, yeah. <laughs> at some points. Let's talk about the feature bout on this fight as well. Sean O'Malley against Thomas Almeida. Now, you, you know about Sean O'Malley, right? Sugar Sean O'Malley. The Sugar Show? The Sugar Show. Now, Tom, Thomas Almeida, when he bursted on the UFC scene, he was, I think he was uh, 19-0, and 0, something like that, and eventually worked his way up to 21-0 and 0 when he fought Cody Garbrandt, got knocked out. Now he's 1-4 in his last five fights. Kind of in a similar situation to uh, Tyron Woodley where he's almost, he's on a three-fight losing streak as well, looking uh, to get back into the spotlight as well for Thomas Almeida. Sean O'Malley coming off a loss. Both of them are in very similar situations where Thomas Almeida could kind of leapfrog over a bunch of up-and-coming contenders with a big uh, notable victory over a guy like Sean O'Malley, which brings a lot of eyes to it. And Sean O'Malley, is looking to recapture what where or get back where he left off in the fight against Marlon Vera. Um, yeah, it could remind me. Um, O'Malley hasn't lost in the UFC. No, he lost right. his last fight against Marlon Vera in kind of a weird way. Okay. Yeah, he had a calf kick early on in the fight and it kind of crippled him. He got taken down, got elbowed, and then was eventually finished. It was a very I weird. I remember. Yeah, I remember watching the uh, the end of that fight. Yeah. Yeah, and going into that, I mean, the knockout that he had on Tuesday Night Contender Series, the original guy on the Contender Series, and the biggest name to come out of it for sure, at least as of yet, uh, to come out of the Contender Series with the win that he had. And I mean, you saw Snoop Dogg going, "Oh, Mally, oh, Mally. I mean, it was oh, perfect. Mally. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. It, it was a perfect introduction, and uh, he won against uh, Ty- Tyrion Ware in his UFC debut, won his next fight, and then had a lot of con- – I'm not going to call it controversy because it really wasn't. He had some weird circumstances with USADA that kept him out, and when he, he came back, he was knocking dudes out. And that knockout that he had over Eddie Wineland, who, keep in mind, was a former WEC Bantamweight champion. Now, he, the inaugural – it legitimately the first um, champion at 135, but that wasn't. I, I could go down a rabbit hole there. Let's just let's just say that it wasn't the same. It was a regional show up until it was Zufa owned. But we have a donation here, real quick. Mark D T Bone on Friday, fantastic. I know, right? Thank you very much for your donation, Mark. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Um, but he lost his last fight against Marlon Vera when his stock was at its absolute highest. And that took a hit. And right now he's in this weird situation where he was he was saying that mentally I'm undefeated. I didn't lose that fight. That was a fluke, yada, yada, yada. So a lot of eyes are going to be on this fight because he's kind of – that's how you turn off MMA fans. MMA fans, we're a weird breed. And when you don't accept losses, that's the worst thing that you can do. That's the worst way to sell yourself is to not accept the loss. Um, right, but- to the to to a lot of fans though, what Sean O'Malley brings to the table, his swagger and his confidence in the ring, definitely brings a lot of eyes on him and gives. I honestly, it's like that Conor McGregor type of confidence and swagger that he brings, and I think that honestly gives him kind of like an intrinsic motivation and advantage in some fights in some regard because of just being so confident in yourself so visibly confident in yourself you know i think i think that's really cool and you see that come out in his style of fighting too i think that's really interesting about him it, it really is and this is what's going to be a very fun stylistic matchup here because thomas almeida fighting out of shoot box academy out of brazil it's a very traditional muay thai type of style you know the leg kick hook you know very basic but very very good style when I say basic, I don't mean that in a bad way. Were you able to get that? Yeah. Um, but it's it's a very ba- – and I don't mean basic in a bad way. It's a very good type of basic, fundamentally very sound, whereas Sean O'Malley is this crazy striker throwing all sorts of different stuff. And that's what makes this a very fun matchup as well. And I think will cause 
Thomas Almeida some problems. This weird, flashy style, I really do. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. Uh, I'm really excited for Sean O'Malley. I, I, I remember that fight now because I was watching it. Uh, it was last summer, right? The end of the last summer, something like that. Yeah, that was... I wasn't deployed quite yet. I was in the pre-deployment quarantine. Um, that's when. That's why I missed that fight. I, I was able to watch it, but I. That, you're talking about the Sean O'Malley fight against Marlon Vera, correct? Yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. no, 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 no. Eddie Wineland. Eddie Wineland. That knockout win that he had. Yeah. No, I'm talking about his loss. Oh, his loss. Yeah, that was back in August. That was back in August. Yeah. 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 At the yeah. end of the summer. Yeah. yeah. He got light kicked. And, and that did, did he was that did that lead to any sort of injury? I can't remember. No, you know that nerve that splits down that leg. I believe it's called the perennial nerve. Um, Is that what it's called? Come on, nurse. Um, I'm sorry. The nerve that goes down your sciatic nerve. It, it's it branches off the sciatic nerve. Oh, um, I I wouldn't know. But it's something that MMA fans know for some reason. For some reason, it's blanking. I think it's called perennial, but it's yeah, I'm blanking on it right now. But there's this pop, nerve that... Poplidial? Poplidial? No, like it's not even pop... No, no, not poplidial either. And that's an artery. That's not even a That's not even a nerve. Well, there's, there's, it's a, more of a region. Fair enough. Fair enough. But it, it splits kind of behind the knee, and it, it's it's slightly exposed. And it, what, ca- it's, um, what causes flexion... Is it adduction or reduction? I can't remember. Is it flexion or extension of the foot itself? Like when you extend your foot out, is that extension? Not, nonetheless. Plantar, plantar flex? Yeah. Plantar um, flex. Doing like a ballerina pose? Yeah, yeah, they have that exactly. Um, when you get a perfectly placed calf kick like that, you can't flex it anymore. So, or you can't really extend it or flex it. So that's when you see these weird moments. Like you remember when Henry Cejudo kind of tripped over his own foot against uh, Mighty Mouse in their in their oh, second fight. Oh yeah, I do remember that. And when Michael Chandler looked like he dislocated his foot and a bunch of weird things, but that's the kind of effect that it has. Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, I got people saying that I was right. Um, <laughs> and somebody. Uh, right on the perennial nerve. Um, perennial. Oh, okay, I've never heard of it. Yeah, somebody had asked me if I'm taking viewer calls. No, this is this is my brother. Um, he'll he'll he's driving oh. over here right now. As a matter of fact. Um, yeah, this is T Bro, everyone. I've uh, been on the show a couple times. Uh, way back when, um, Ty- I'm driving down to North Carolina to see Tyler right now, um, and it's been how long has it been? It's been since Christmas of 2019 since we've seen each other. Yeah, almost almost 14 months. A shade under 14 months. No, 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 no. 15. More than that. 15. More than that. Almost 16. Almost 16. Yeah, almost 16. Nearly a year. Jeez. Over a year, yeah. Um, that's weird. Yeah. Gosh, that's so weird. How far out are you right now, by the way? I am 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, and you... Let me know when you start to see the gate in the distance, and I think that's when we're gonna gonna wrap it up when you're going through the gate and everything. Okay. Do you want me to? Okay. I'll just I'll just get there and then we'll figure out food situation. But let's keep going on our conversation here. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Um, another stat that makes this fight all the more interesting as well. Um, I, I love looking at the strikes landed per minute rate in the UFC or for any UFC fighter for that matter Sean O'Malley lands 6.35 significant strikes per minute which averages what is that nearly 35 significant strikes per minute just a shade under it maybe like 30 between 30 and 35 per round that is per round what's that and then per round yeah per round and then for Thomas Almeida it's 5.39 which that's extremely high because 6.35 significant strikes landed per minute puts Sean O'Malley at number three all time at 135. And for Thomas Almeida, his 5.39 puts him at number six, 135 all time. So if you at least look at those, we have a very high output fight on our hands, which could get out of hand very quick and might be very fun between two conflicting styles um, that could make this a very interesting dynamic. 
Yeah, that's that's gonna be a, a lot of fun. Both both our feature fights in uh, the co-main. That's it's gonna be a couple of exciting fights right there. Yeah, and it's it's super unfortunate that Volkanovski and Brian Ortega fell through because this just would have yeah. been a stacked main card. But the top three fights in particular are the are the best fights on this card, no doubt about it. Now this Jillian Robertson against Miranda Maverick fight, that's a good one as well. Women's one twenty five, but it's it doesn't have the same type of level of intrigue. But I, I'll tell you this much about uh, Miranda Maverick, and to give you a brief intro into this fight. Jillian Robertson, she's only 9-5 and five in her career, only 14 fights, but she's fought nine times at 125, which is the mo- pretty much the most fights. She holds almost every record that you can have at 125 right now just because it's a new weight class. Like most wins with six, most stoppages with five, most submissions, shortest average fight time, second most control time, highest control time percentage. The list goes on and on with the records that Jillian Robertson has, whereas Miranda Maverick is kind of a new breed of women's 125-er where she kind of made her entire career at one women's 125, which is a relatively new weight class. 1-0 now in the UFC, which she won via doctor stoppage. And what we saw in her last fight against Leanna Dojua is the fact that she has significant power in her hands and great dex, uh, great diversity in her, in her strikes. But yet before that, she was known as a grappler. She's the brown belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu and has five submissions in her uh, MMA career. That's um, Miranda Maverick. And in fact, she's from Norfolk, Virginia. You just drove through there. Um, yeah. And she's 23 years old as a southpaw. Um, fights off her power hand, which is her left hand, not off her jab. She's, a, she's an exciting fighter. Miranda Maverick, currently a PhD student in psychology as well. Um, she's a, an exciting fighter that could bring some new life to 125, which for the longest time was compiled of fighters that were at women's 115 and at 135 that weren't good at 135 and weren't good at 115. So we kind of compromised a little bit. And then you have Valentina Shevchenko up there murking people. Uh, yeah, that's going to be a tough one. Woman to beat yeah, and she's so far ahead. And Miranda Maverick, I'm not saying she's going to be the one that beats her at 125. I think if there's anybody that beats her at 125, it's Jessica Andrade, and they're fighting on the next pay per view at UFC 261. But Miranda Maverick will bring some new life to the division that it desperately needs. This Miranda Maverick girl is really good, and I'm really excited. And she has a tough competition in front of her and Jillian Robertson. And um, yeah, it, it's it's going to be a good one. It's gonna be a good one. I'm looking forward to that one. That one's the second bout on the uh, on the main card. Those four fights in particular are my absolute favorite, and I'll I'll run you through some of the other ones, but those are the ones that I kind of wanted to focus on for this specifically. Right. Shoot. Ah. I moved my desk a little bit. I will need to. Viewer, uh, people that are listening right now, uh, what are your predictions for the main fight? We haven't really asked too many questions yet. Yeah, I'll, I'll open it up um, in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, I'm sorry that it's been a while since we've been able to talk. We've been talking for like nearly three hours before the podcast and during this. Um, I'm sure that made your drive a little faster, didn't it? <laughs> Did you get that? Are you still talking? Yeah. Were, were you able to hear that? I, I said we talked for nearly three hours in total before no. the podcast and after. Or during it, pardon me. Hello. Hello, I'm back. Okay, sick, sick. Um, I said we were talking for nearly three hours um, before the podcast and during it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we we covered a lot of bases, but we kind of cut our MMA conversation short so we could uh, so we could stream it. So yeah, we we cut it like we we were talking for like five minutes about MMA. I'm like, let's stop this because this is actually some good content. But let's open it up to you guys. Um, it's been a while since AJ and I have talked to each other, but let's open up to you guys a little bit. What do y'all think about uh, specifically the main fight, Steve Bay versus Francis? Um, I focus on skills. Not where you, oh, people are they're going back and forth in the comments right now. That, that's kind of what happens when I go off on a tangent. Sometimes I'm left out of the out of the loop a little bit. Um, bring the attention back to me. <laughs> Sometimes that's what I feel like. Um, Steve Bay smash. But guys, thank you so much for tuning in, by the way. Um, sorry, I, I read all your guys' comments during this, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, 
somebody said, I don't know, I'm a dad of two girls, and I would be as proud of them for being a doctor as a, a as a UFC fighter, or uh, as a doctor or a UFC fighter. That'd be pretty sick having a daughter as a UFC fighter, or even a doctor for that matter. Um, that's what I was thinking. Like uh, cousin Charlotte, she's just a su- superb athlete, um, and you know that she's doing so well with hockey right now. Um, yeah, yeah. Shout out Charlotte. Yeah, she's Minnesota. playing. Yeah. She's playing in the state tournament in, in Minnesota with a very good team. I mean, she she could go on to do great things in hockey, and she's just that kind of athlete. But I think about she's young. She's only like eleven. She's like eleven or twelve, right? I, I yeah. think. What if she pursued MMA? How good would she be with how athletic she is? Um, that's the only real sport for women out there that they can make a living at, right? Um, I mean, it, it, it really, it really does depend. I mean, women's soccer definitely has uh, a little bit of money in it, but definitely uh, the most interesting women's sport to me, I'm um, sorry, I got to make my exit here. I got to speed a little bit, but, um, it's definitely women's fighting, uh, it's just specifically UFC. It's, I mean, especially yeah. over the last 10 years, the way it has grown and been such an integral part of the UFC is just it's honestly just amazing um and you know you get fights like um zan and um, Bro, um joanna i was about to say i was about to say Joanna's rose Joanna's that's gonna be an awesome game. fight but yeah yeah rose. yeah um or you know and then athletes like thug rose manda nunez uh, Chris Cyborg, like these true female athletes that just push the limit. Um, they, they, you know, they remind me of these CrossFit athletes too, these female CrossFit, CrossFit athletes uh, that, you know, are just athletic specimens, really. Yeah. Somebody mentioned women's tennis. They probably make more. Um, fair enough. If you're Serena Williams. Um but it's the only sport that gets the same type of recognition on the same platform that in any other sport. Um, I mean, there's no women's basketball. I mean, there is women's basketball in um, in college, I guess. But the WNBA, uh, not to be offensive to anybody, but it's kind of it's kind of a joke. I'm not saying that the players don't have skills, but in terms of just recognition, it's a joke. Um, but women's MMA, it, it, it's not a joke. They've proven themselves time and time again that they're athletic they can knock each other and they're just as skilled as the men i mean they obviously women can't fight a man that's a completely different story but they have the skills and it's almost more fun to watch them if you admire their technique um because you don't have that knockout power getting in the way as well it's just a different breed and it's it's very fun to watch i find it very appealing that that's just me yeah i do i do too um yeah and just the way it's like the mastery of their skills because of the lack of power like the mastery that you need to have to be successful in those um, especially in, in the lighter divisions is kind of I mean unparalleled compared to the, the male lead because you still have that knockout power even at the lower um, weight levels where you don't with the female so they really have to be able to score points and land strikes um with precision, you know, to get, to make up for where they lack in power, just biologically. Yeah, and if you ask me, I mean, if, if you don't like female fights because there's no knockouts, on this fight card in particular, there are nine other fights. Who cares? I mean, that's what I love exactly. about MMA. There's so much diversity in it. I mean, you could have a complete snooze fest of a wrestler, or and I like wrestling too. I love jujitsu. You know me. That's when I light up the most when commentating fights. Um, but I love seeing diversity. I was watching, uh, this Russian promotion a few weeks ago and I, I almost fell asleep during my stream because every fight was exactly the same. I love a good wrestling match, but every single fight was exactly the same and it bothered me. I did not like it. That's why I can't watch boxing. I love boxing, uh, but I can only watch one boxing match. That's just me. It's like watching. Just get so, so redundant. Yeah, and it's it's so almost frustrating. Oh, sorry. 
Um, by the way, Charlotte, Charlotte won. I was wondering about that. Charlotte won her uh, first uh, game in the state tar- state tournament. And when you talk yeah, like, yeah. yeah, so that's good. That's good to hear. They won. Yeah, and I, I'm just so finding that out now. Shout out, shout out to everyone that's um, everyone at the the Thorough Place that's watching right now. Yeah, shout out to everybody at the Thorough Place as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and now that, that I got their attention, Charlotte would make a very good fighter. I'm just going to throw that one, float that one out there as well. I was teaching her some uh, jiu-jitsu when she was really young up at the cabin. Uh, she could be really good. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, I don't think that they're going to enjoy that very, hearing that very much, but oh, well, there it is. <laughs> it's out there. It's out there. Um, but yeah, these are some... Uh, that being said, Jillian Robertson against Miranda Maverick is a very, very good fight. And if you ask me, I mean, the Alonzo Metafield fight, was that's a good one as well between two knockout artists. Um, William Knight, I believe his name is. I got the note in front of me. Yeah, William Knight... William Knight has won eight of his nine fight or eight of his nine wins by knockout. Same thing with Alonzo Manafield. So that's the feature bout on the on the uh, ESPN prelims. Charlotte had one goal and one assist too. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, that's that's actually awesome to hear. Congratulations, Charlotte. Um, it is. It was weird watching her play. I'm sorry to keep going on a tangent here, but it was weird watching her play because I, I was. I'm kind of living vicariously through her. Her now, I'm sure you are too, because our our athletic career, careers are basically done, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a weird thought. Um, but anyway, William Knight against Alonzo Manfield, the feature battle in the ESPN prelims, two knockout artists uh, that will go head to head. That has potential for being a very good fight. It might have that Francis Ngannou against um, Derek Lewis type of vibe as well. Sometimes when you put two knockout artists together, it can sometimes be a dud, especially ones that are coming off of losses. Oh, pardon me, William Knight is coming off a unanimous decision victory. That was 23 days after his uh, win on the TNOS Susan Contender Series. But that, that fight in particular is made to be a slugfest. That's what that fight is, is for. You all right? Yeah, I'm good. I'm sorry. I'm uh, just fixing my nap here. Oh, okay. And then uh, another interesting name thrown on this card as well. Um, Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov, the cousin of Habib, making his second appearance in the UFC against Jared Gooden. Um, Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov, excuse me, lost uh, via triangle in his UFC debut. So we'll get to see him back in the octagon. Maybe he'll have the same success as Habib. I, think I, I mean, uh, what's I think that? I cut out there for me. Oh. I think I cut out. I said that uh, the cousin of Habib, Abu Bakar Namagomedov, is fighting this weekend. Uh, that's going to be another interesting name thrown in there as well. He's coming off a loss in his UFC debut, as a matter of fact. Um, so there's going to be a lot of eyes on him as well. He's taking on a guy uh, in Jared Gooden. Doesn't have the same type of name. Jared Gooden lost it in his UFC debut against Alan Joban. Very experienced, tough fighter in the UFC. So tough draw again for uh, Jared Gooden, if you ask me. Um. So that's another interesting fight there on the card. But those are basically the big names. Uh, This card took a hit with COVID in the last week, if you weren't paying attention. Um, It it took a hit. There was a lot of fights that fell through due to COVID mitigation stuff. And still, knock on wood, every fighter made weight, by the way. Every fighter made weight. But in terms of COVID mitigation, it, it, it got a little weird. So we're still holding our breath a little bit on that right now. You still there? Yep, I'm still here. Okay, cool, cool. I just wanted to make sure. Um, how far are you? All good. Just hit a little bit of traffic. I'm 13 minutes away. 13 minutes away. All right. Um, I think this is a good time to wrap it up. Um, let me know when you're at the gate. And uh, will do. Yeah, and we'll we'll meet up. I haven't seen him in nearly. We we said nearly 16 months. So it's gonna be good seeing you again, even though we've been talking for the last uh, last three three and a half hours. But oh yeah, it's gonna be a good uh, gonna be a good card. I'm really looking forward to being on the on the, the stream again. Yeah, and I, I got to figure out a, a good chair situation for you, um, but we'll figure that out when you get here. But anyway, um, I'm gonna say goodbye to you first. I'm gonna hang up on on you. We'll and then I'm gonna close out the show and then call me when you're when you're near so we can meet up. Perfect. Perfect. All right. See you later, Agent. Yeah. Bye. That was that was fun. Was the um, 
was the audio pretty clear on that? I, that was just fun in general for me. Um, thanks for streaming the pre I appreciate it, Russell. I'm sorry that I didn't inter interact with you guys too much. Um, we haven't seen each other forever, and it's been very fun to talk about fights. Um, we almost kind of match our enthusiasm, so my enthusiasm will be through the roof. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. And I think it was good for us to have some interaction because I haven't done this with the co-host in some time. I think it was good. But what would you guys think? Did, for phone calls like that, how was the audio? First off, I, I, I wanted to mention that as well. Was the audio okay? Did, did that Was that good? Um, that's one thing that I wanted to ask. Could you guys hear everything okay? Did everything come through? And two, which is that something that you want to see in the future? Me have uh, a calling guests and stuff like that. If I can figure out how to have fans call in, that's something that I would like to see in the future as well. Um, but what did you guys think? The audio was fine. Perfect. Um, that, that's great to hear. I was a little bit worried about the audio, but I, I was winging it. Um, see you tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be some good freaking fights. It's going to be some great fights tomorrow. Those top four fights are fantastic. I, I can't express to you guys enough. It's going to be a very good card. Um, very unfortunate that Volkanovski and Brian Ortega fell through, but the next two cards, next two pay-per-view cards, I believe they have three title fights apiece. Let me double check that. Um, I, I got to hold my breath on that real quick. Um, UFC 2, I got to look up future UFC, future events. Because maybe we'll see the unthinkable. You have 261, Usman versus Masvidal 2. 262, Oliveira versus Chandler. Okay, that's the only fight so far in UFC 262. So I jumped out a little bit ahead. It'd be fun seeing that fight um, get thrown on that card. Or perhaps on the next card, imagine having four title fights on a card that's never been done before. That would be very fun as well. Audio is good. That's great to hear. Redskins, the, the Braves, what? <laughs> Hey everyone in the chat, I uh, hope you all enjoy your night, uh, heck of a night, goodbye next time. I appreciate it Richard, guys thank you so much, I want to say it one more time, uh, Sweep Shredder, if you had a person split screen uh, like Fat Joe does on his podcast, and yes it'd be cool if you had some people, news, MMA debate about things, yeah yeah exactly, that would have been great as well to have uh, sometime in the future, I gotta figure that kind of stuff out because it's a learning curve for me. I'm not very good at the technology stuff. I'm able to figure it out. But anyway, I'm going to wrap this up because he might have some problems getting through the gate uh, on our on our base. But anyway, I'm just really excited to see him. I haven't seen him in forever. So anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. It's going to be a great night of fights. I, by the way, guys, um, anytime I see your guys' names on these type of sh these, these type of shows, the preview shows, the discussions, the whatever shows that I might do previously, I remember you all. I just want to say I, I really appreciate you guys for coming on. Greatly appreciative. I think letting people call in would be a great idea. Letting a fan call, um, letting any fan call, yeah, exactly. Um, that might lead to some issues down the road, but we'll see. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Really appreciate. It. Really appreciate it. This is Tyler Burke from T1 MMA, and I will catch you guys later. See you all tomorrow. Immigrant mentality against the Ford Escort. See y'all later.